Hello and welcome to the Little Minds Big Ideas podcast with the Early Years Network. Woo! Hello again. Hello again. We're back. This week you wanted to do something a little bit different. Spice it up. Spice it up. And we wanted to do our own version of Mythbusters for the Early Years. Mythbusters! <laughs> exactly that, yeah. So we've got seven sort of myths that people in the industry, obviously, we know it's not true, but in general, as an early years educator or someone in the industry, you usually get told these things. or the myths. The myths. I've said so, another good myth bust in that, though. They do, yeah. That's why I said we're going to do our do our own version we of can't. myth version. Miss, bleh, myth busters. Myth busting. That's hard for me to say that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go. Shall we jump in with number one? What is number one? The first one is play in an early year setting is a time filler and has no benefit to children's development. That's true, isn't it? Uh-uh. 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 No. <laughs> play so, does oh, have a purpose. It does. You're right. It does. It does. <laughs> End off. Next one. And no, I'm joking. Um, we've obviously talked a lot about the importance of play, the power of play. We've got. Ben's book behind me. Not mine. Not yours. I ben have Kingston, a book. Ben Kingston Hughes. <laughs> the Unusual Journey into Play, which highlights how important play is for children. Um, and we know in the early years industry that play is crucial. This this one, this this myth isn't, an, I don't think, an in-industry myth. I think this is like Out we always industry. talk about. Like We've done yeah. multiple podcasts now these last few weeks talking about societal's view of early years and play. And that's where this comes from. Yeah. This, I don't think there's many people left in early years, or I'll hope not. <laughs> that still don't. Fingers crossed. But actually, saying that, I think there's levels to it. I think there's levels to people's understanding, probably even in the industry still. There's people who fully understand the fundamentals on the importance of play. Yet there actually probably is still a large proportion of people that know play is important, but don't know why. Yeah. Or... They just think, you know, children are little people and they're here to have a good time and a good time only. Don't put too much pressure on them yet, which is sort of right. Yeah. But then they probably lean too much. I mean, I always go back to the amount of comments we get on TikTok sometimes. I don't get paid enough to do that as well. <laughs> sometimes as I read it, my head just explodes. I don't know. Um, we know that play provides children with opportunities for learning loads of different things. I've just got written down a few. Communication, language, social skills, problem solving skills, uh, friendships, boundaries, all these different things can be learned through play. And there's also brain development I think the, support as well, I, isn't there? I think the other thing I would talk, following on from last week's podcast, play doesn't have to end when children leave the EYFS okay. and go to Key Stage 1 and Key Stage 2. And and, and play doesn't actually have to ever stop. Um, you just change what the play is. And it goes... It probably the best way to talk about it is enjoyment. And, and and then it becomes like you get to secondary school and you actually hear a lot nowadays about, oh, how can we use gamification and turn it into a game? And that's still play. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's still, and, you know, grown men still play. They, you go play football or golf or... And women. Hadn't got there yet. But yes, <laughs> women play football and golf. But okay, I was being sexist. But <laughs> when you break it down, people, adults, adults still, still play. play. Yeah. And, and in their different ways. And... There's no reason why that needs to be stripped out of education. Yes, the higher up, because of the system we talked long and hard about. We're not getting back into what that. Was the education depth, system it? is and, and, and the benefits of it and, 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 and what it does and, and the, the process of the educational system. Yeah. But there is still a massive element for play because at the end of the day, children enjoy it. And isn't it rubbish that we have a scenario now where children, if you spoke to most children who go to school, they don't like going to school. They're all really excited when it's summertime and... Yeah, everybody wants time off and et cetera, yeah. but they shouldn't be that excited to leave school behind. No. I'm, that's quite sad. Yeah, it is. No, it is. And I think that's one of the things as an educator in the early years when someone says, oh, you're just playing. There's no point to what you think. Oh, my Lord. I wish that I could just play and reap the benefits that play brings for children. But there's so much more than that. And, and it's weird, though, because we sort of understand the fundamentals of it when you look at... If you look at a pack of lion cubs and talk to like the generic person when they go to I don't know, a zoo or you see them yeah. out and about in the documentary programs. How many lion cubs did you see out and about? I don't mean out and about when you go to Tesco's. <laughs> we must we must go to different shopping places. Do you not see the friendly lions? No, never. Oh. Interesting. You go run across the car park. <laughs> <laughs> ah. 
Um, no, when you people have more of an understanding of when you see lion cubs fighting, like of how they're preparing themselves for future life, and <laughs> though they're not ripping chunks out of each other, they're learning combat, they're keeping yeah. themselves fit. You know, what I mean, they're doing all those type of things, and it's the same even like with dogs. You know, we were talking about this weirdly the other day. When dogs bite bones, that instinct to want to gnaw on yes. a bone and stuff, it comes from predatory instincts. And dogs have been well and truly domesticated, of course. Yeah. They're not actually... I don't think our dogs would cope very well out in the wild. But that's where, like, <laughs> gnawing on things and bones keep their teeth clean, healthy and sharp. Yeah, ready if, if they needed to. An animal like a dog, when it was in the wild, lost its teeth or its teeth became dull or they fell out and stuff they die because they can no longer manage yeah. to get food for themselves. They can't eat meat. They can't crunch bones and kill out. Like, do you know what I mean? They lose that. And and, and that's all inher inherent in them. It's hereditary. They can't get rid of that. No. Children is the same. Their want and desire to play and develop themselves physically. Yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah. It's, it's almost out of their control. Yeah, they, they naturally do it. It's, it's what's in them to, to do when they're that young. So, so yeah. why are we stopping them? No, exactly. And it does have benefits. And there's multiple lessons and classes on the Early Years Network platform about the power of play. I think all of them in some way, shape, form, touch. Reflect it. Yes, I know, but we've got specifics, learning through play. We've got mm -hmm. Ben's um, course on there. We've got others that I'm sure I've lost. The My neuroscience one delves into it. Neuroscience one delves into it. My enabling environments one. There's a load. So. And most of the theorist ones I do and touch upon in some way, shape, or form probably touched upon it. Yep. So if you want to give anyone a bit more of an insight, direct them to the Early Years Network platform and tell them to watch a few videos and learn why play is so important and continues to be for young children. Get your knowledge up. Yeah. Right, number two. Ready? I'm born ready. Men don't make good early years educators. Spicy. Yeah. These are like hot takes more than myths, aren't they? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not my hot takes, <laughs> just saying. <laughs> These are all Emily's opinions. No, it's not. No, no, no. So that is a very stereotypical view on men in childcare. Sure. You know Even as a male in early years, this is a real difficult one because every most people, and whether they're willing to admit this, have a view of men in early years. Yeah. And... And you can always test this by men in baby rooms yeah. and how what your comfortable level is. With and it's wrong. And I, and I know having this view and apprehension around having a male practitioner in a baby room is wrong. I'm fully aware of that. But I still hold that yeah. deep down. I still think, oh, you know. But, but then also as from someone leading nurseries as well, I think about I know damn well if we put a male practitioner in some of our, in some of our nurseries into the baby room, that not backlash probably wouldn't be the right word. I would receive a number of questions, queries. Absolutely. I can guarantee it. And that is still the environment we live in. We still live in a, and, and the same people who come and complain about it will be the same people in a separate conversation will complain about sexism in the workplace. Yeah. And, 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 but they won't realize their own prejudice and they won't realize their own. And some of them may buckle that. I would never air it and I would never stop a male working in a baby room. I would never go against it. I'd prepare no. my managers for what potentially could come and I would talk it through and we'll go through the whole thing, weigh it up, but I'll never stop it. No. But I would I am aware of my own prejudice deep down, what I feel, and you can't you can't help that. No. Whereas it's interesting because I've worked with different males mm. in, in earlier settings for years now. Mm. And I've got in my notes here that that maternal instinct that a lot of women have and some women don't have. Mm -hmm. Some men do have that maternal and that nurturing instinct in them. So they provide children with as good a level of care as any woman could. Absolutely. Because, sorry, I was okay. just saying, because when they are in those environments, they're in the environments because it's the job they want to pursue. Yeah. And it's like me. I would not enjoy working on a construction site. I don't like being outside, like in that environment all day, every day with my hands getting cold, moving heavy things. Like, like, it's just a no from me. Thank you. But there are some women who are very good at that and would thrive on a building site. And it's the same for men. Just because it's not the typical place that a man would work doesn't mean they shouldn't. 
And the fact that there's a view that they don't make good educators, regardless of what room they're in, like you said, it just blows my mind because it's still... Uh, and Yeah, I don't know. It's weird because it, it stops at early years, though. Because primary, primary school teachers, teachers yeah. having males, like, people are all for it. And, well, they want it. I yeah. want my child to have the male teacher because he's strong and then they'll get a good role model from it. Yeah. But why should it be different in early years? And it's I don't get room. it. Normally, yeah. But it is like, it is, it is often the baby room. Like yeah. preschool, we have males working in it. Twos, yeah. But it's the baby room where that, that stereotype yeah. really kicks in. And it, and it definitely comes and it starts from the old sexist ways of looking at the woman stays home and looks after the child and yeah. the man goes to work. It comes from that and then it proliferates into other spheres of, like you say, are they good enough things? Then you have the whole, you know, is he a pedo? And that aspect, and you can joke, but that is a, that is a thing that is where it comes from as well. that's a stereotype sure, as well, because yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. all men no, that are no, committing those crimes. Not. Just so, because you're born with or without Willie doesn't mean either you're going to be a good parent, you're going to be a no. pedo, or you're going to be able to care for babies any better or worse. It, yeah. It, it, we, we know this, you know, it's the same as it doesn't matter if you're gay, straight, black, white, like none of it no. matters because that doesn't actually define anyone in any way, shape or form in any facet of life. No. We all understand that, yet people still have these uh, views. views and stuff. Yeah. And some of it is very forthright and some people are very obnoxious with it. Other people will keep it suppressed. It's just the way, different ways around it. And, and men in early years will probably always be in some way, shape or form. And you'll never get a high volume of men working in early years, no matter how many people try. No. It will never Which is a change shame. overnight. And there's a whole litany and plethora of reasons. It's not just because of stereotypes. I no. think there's a whole other range of reasons. We've got an exciting podcast on that coming. We have, In yes. a few months. Yeah. So you can dive into that. A little bonus episode you will have. be coming out. Uh, I don't know. In the next few months. May time-ish. Yeah. June time-ish. Um, so, yeah, but that was one of the ones I wanted to just delve into a little bit because... Be, it would be interesting to know how many people listen, how many have male workers um, in, in their, their settings. settings. Yeah. I mean, it would be interesting. And what age groups are they they working in? Yeah, because a lot of our settings are very rural. It'd be interesting to see if city settings are different. Yeah. You get more. Um, it'd be interesting to see if different parts of the country are different. Because I have heard of settings where they've got multiple male practitioners working. And well, when I spoke to Jordan last yeah. year, his we said that one of his was I can't remember what the percentage was. But it was a high percentage. I think it's majority men. In yeah, life, it was eighty percent, something like that. Damn, I can't well, um, that seems really high. Then I know. So, but yeah, yeah interesting. It would, be, it would be it would be intriguing. It'd be interesting to see what would draw men more to the industry. Yeah, it would, it would be fascinating. Um, I don't know. I, I wonder if some people are scared to do it because of stereotypes. Money. I wonder if money would be a factor. I wonder if some men... I don't know, because I think it then also links back into what we talked about earlier about it just being play and frivolous, so there's no real educational side to early years, so it's seen as a lesser job. Yeah. Like many. The knowledge of it is because, not there Because, like we said it, in the last yeah. one, education isn't seen to be starting until you hit primary school. So if I'm going to have a career, I'm going to be a teacher. That leads me nicely on to point three. Let's go. The early years industry doesn't provide a career or good job opportunities. Well, the point that I've written down is look at us. Yeah. We do a weekly podcast based on early years and that if that's not an opportunity within a career, I don't know what is. Yeah, at the moment I feel like I do eight jobs, so. <laughs> yeah, how many more jobs do I want? Um, but an early years career will look different for everyone. Um, becoming a qualified practitioner is an achievement in itself. Yeah. Doing that qualification um, whatever that looks like, level two, three, five, degree, whatever it is. Um, and some people will want to take on more responsibility than others. Some will be happy in that educator practitioner role, coming in, educating children and going home. Like that's that's enough job satisfaction. That is what they enjoy and they thrive at doing. Others might want to become leaders or specialise in specific areas, train other people, become managers, leap into other industry uh, areas of the industry healthcare into schools becoming business owners and I've just put like a career is what you make it and there's no right or wrong way to create a career in early years and when we provide people with opportunities to develop and grow they'll make what they can of it yeah, yeah and it will look different for everybody but it doesn't mean that the early years industry is you qualify you become a room lead you could become a manager and then it ends no, early which is the typical route. 
Early years is so versatile. Yeah. Like there's so many avenues you can go down. Like with a school and become a teacher, you become a teacher, you gain more responses within that area, but it's quite, do you yeah. know what I mean? It, that is sort of, and you can develop more responsibility, I'm sure. Whereas in early years, you could literally become anything and everything. Yeah. Like there's people in early years who work in it from a social media standpoint. And there's people who work in early years in certain companies and design equipment children play with. Like, and I'm, school's the same, I guess. I'm sort of just going against my own point there. But <laughs> I think what I'm trying to say is you, you can proliferate from your career in choosing what you want to expert tea in yeah. and if it is just purely working with your children again like that can take you anywhere you can end up joining a business and working in in, in proliferating the um, curriculum and what children do yeah. and there's like, like it doesn't just have to end at oh I'm, I've qualified as a practitioner that's it for the rest of my career now. I also think as well like a career doesn't mean a job title no and what like you just said about building a curriculum if you are a nursery manager or a room leader or a practitioner and you are helping to build a curriculum, that's part of your career. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is uh, that is an opportunity for development just because your, top, your job title isn't room leader slash curriculum developer. It no. doesn't mean you're not doing it. And I think that's where people struggle is that just because you've not got the title, it doesn't mean you're not developing and doing more within your career. The biggest struggle in early years, and again, it comes back, we should have a little gong at this point for every time, money's and funding and everything's mentioned. Oh. Um, Ka-ching! <laughs> it comes down to money because like as much as any business would want to drive forwards uh, and I'd love across all our business if we could employ more curriculum developers um, environment developer like people who specialise in these type of things yeah. but unfortunately because of how it, the whole thing runs and how the whole thing operates it's really difficult to employ more people than just the, the bog standard ratio amount ratio demands. requires that's what puts the the scuppers on a lot of that avenue. Yeah. Um, and equally, in early years, there tends to be this this idea that one longevity equals promotion equals management job. Yeah. But not everybody suits a management job and, and a leadership role in terms of yeah. leading people or dealing with admin. It, just because you're great at working with children and you're exceptional Fantastic in that, that area yeah. doesn't mean you're going to be a natural leader. And that also doesn't mutually exclusively mean that you're a failure. Does, does that make sense? No, yeah. So many times people go down a path of becoming a manager because that's what they think they should become, but it's not for them. And and it's that's up to the companies then to think about how can we create leadership roles that encompass different areas of the business. But that's what I'm saying. It, it Just because it's not your title doesn't mean you're not developing. Yeah. And striving, like you say, to be a leader when that's not your natural place to shine mm -hmm. isn't where you would... Deserve. Like, let's take Lucy, for example, who everybody knows from the, the website and she has been on a few episodes of the podcast. Lucy. Lucy has developed over the last few years becoming a qualified educator and she's fantastic at that. But the setting she's in at the moment, that next step of the typical room lead isn't actually available yet because no. the people in those roles are steady in there. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. <laughs> However, Lucy's taken it upon herself to create her two's outdoor learning group. And she's developed that and she's worked with the forest school and she takes them up every day and she's got in a routine and she has developed that alongside management, but she's led that. Her top title is not Lucy, qualified educator, leader of the outdoor. Two like that's no. not her job role, but her deve her career development has progressed. And equally, um, I'm sure Lucy won't mind me sharing yeah. that. <laughs> but equally for Lucy, let's, let's talk about Lucy. She may decide that she doesn't want to become a manager, like in the future. Yeah. That, that might not be her aspiration. Equally, she might realise actually it doesn't suit me either. It's not. It's not the person. I don't know. I'm talking. Um, Sky yeah. high. Lucy's a young girl. She could become anything. anything she and who knows what she'll be in five, ten years' time? But th that isn't what I'm trying to say. The only and I, and, I, and I think as an industry, we've sort of got to get away from thinking it. I mean, many settings um, have already done this, but it's not a straight line: practitioner, room lead, deputy, manager. No. Because you're forcing people. I mean, most deputies actually do admin work across setting most of I've ever seen you look at job description of them or what they do they're either in numbers or in numbers and then responsible for all the shit the manager actually doesn't want to do normally around the computer and stuff it's about understanding your people when you're talking about yeah. leaders and that's our job roles to understand 
and any leaders listening to this, understand your people, what they're good at. You might have a member of staff who's great with the children. You would never trust her to be a leader in the million. She tends to wind the staff up more than anything, but she's great. She comes in every, every day. She's really good with the children and she's always on social media. She has her own little social media account at home that she runs. Well, there you go. That's probably the ideal person to put a social media for the company and give us some responsibility yeah. in that area. It's about understanding people. You might have someone who's really good at music or arts or gardening. Again, lean on those skills in their exactly. employment and bring that out of them rather than trying to force them down a role of managing people that will probably end up getting them more stressed, build up anxiety, and then probably in five years' time, either somehow swallowed it and gotten over it and become a leader and, you know, sort of bodge it, or have left because I've actually you forced them into a role and they now see no way back. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's what I'm saying. Every career looks different and early years industry has loads of opportunities to expand and do more. Absolutely. Number four. The world is your oyster. Yes. Number four. <laughs> you don't need to do anything with a baby. They won't remember it anyway. I've got on this one. Brain development. Ben to discuss. <laughs> Hit us with some neuroscience knowledge, Ben. I think we've overdone neuroscience over the last few episodes, but I think it, it sort of goes about saying that. They may not remember the specifics, but they will learn to talk if you talk with them. It's one of those things <laughs> where even if we just talk about building relationships and we talk about secure attachments, the child may not necessarily remember what mum, dad, family members, Caregivers, yeah. early years educators do for them in those first three years. Because our brains haven't developed, the memory function of our brain hasn't fully developed. Thus, that is why you don't remember being a baby because that part of your brain hasn't developed. You know, yeah. There's no, no secret about that. Um, but the positives and also vice versa, if damage is done, stays. So you yes. may not remember why, but the damage can stay. Yeah. If you fail to build secure attachments, if a child um, is met with forms of abuse, neglect, the effects on the brain will be everlasting. That's not to say, right, that child, that individual, that human screwed, whatever they've done, no, that's, yeah. that's it. Obviously, it's not that for like black and white. But the effects on the brain, the, the, the physical um, structure of it, the damage that can be done to the physical structure is real. Yes. That does have a, a long-lasting effect. It's not irreversible by any stretch of the imagination. You know, someone who suffering abuse for the first three years gets taken away from that environment, fostered, really loving care and family, boom, they can become the most successful individual in the world. Yeah. No doubt. But the longer that goes on, the more damaging that long-term effect will be. And don't get me wrong, somebody can be in an abusive, neglectful um, childhood all of their life and still become an incredibly successful human being. Of course, yeah. Would they... I have big, would it be different would their brain structure be different if they came from a caring background yeah of course it's not I'm not saying it's a, a black and white game but what happens in a in a baby's early life it is really fucking important it is yeah. and it doesn't ever become less or more important but what does change is is the concept of neuroplasticity in those first five years the formation of the structure of the brain like I said these neurological connections that develop him Malinations are whole time high, like all of these things. It's it's that prime moment where the benefits are sky high, and engaging that child's brain development, social skills, independence, language, everywhere and everywhere. You know, I mean, all these things. Yeah, it's a really prime opportunity for it, and thus they may not remember how to write their name in this time. They may not learn all these quite complex things, but the foundations being put in place. Yeah. And there you go. So you don't need to do anything with the baby. They won't remember it anyway. Uh -uh. In a lot, Denied. In, in a lot of ways, I'd argue like the baby room and the two's room is the most important Boom. part. Yeah. Like it doesn't feel like it because everyone thinks, oh, the learning then starts to get to preschool, like school readiness starts to get to preschool. But to provide them... Those foundations. Yeah, like it, it's so, so important. Like when parents just bring children to nursery, starting at preschool... Versus children who have been there the whole time. You can tell. Quite often you can tell. Yeah. Um, Next. Yeah. I was going to say, sorry, I lost my notes. It disappeared for a second. Apologies. Um, you happy on that one? I am. Yeah. Given your 
Spice wanna? More spice. Yeah. Number five. The early years qualifications are really easy. Go on then, Emily. Are they? So I've got theories, health and safety, brain development, partnership working, play learning opportunities, developmental milestones, working in collaboration with others. Um, the, quali the qualification itself covers so many different areas and it's not easy. Do you know what? I'm going to... I don't like the level three. I'm not saying I like it, but I'm saying that I don't think to quote unquote it as easy is fair. No, it's not. It's not. It's not easy. Because my argument is on these qualifications is I understand when you do a college-based qualification, you do have to go on placements. However, that is not the reality of early years. No. So it's all well and good being like, oh, I smashed through my coursework. Yeah, but I did three hours of the whatever it was, the, what am I trying to say? Placements. The placements that I did, that's fine. But that doesn't, mean that the qualification is easy because putting that qualification into practice is a completely different ball game and then you have doing it as an apprentice on the job you then have the stress of actually carrying a job so again that qualification process is not easy no because you're juggling a job and a qualification they both have their own strengths and weaknesses yeah but the qualification itself to link back to a practical job isn't easy because I could learn all the theorists in the world, but I still have to relate them back to how it's supporting children in a setting. Do you not think the level three is outdated now? Oh, 100%. 100% outdated, but it is what it is. And they have just released the new one. And is it's this, taking different ways and different routes. Is it still full of, of learning the theorists of the 1920s? Yeah, they have still got theories in there, yeah. I just think there's not many other industries now where their leading qualification is based upon how dated scientific research it seems yeah. a bit strange to me imagine if like you went to, <laughs> imagine if you went private right you had like as a health issue you wanted to have some sort of operation done mm. and the doctor was like look i'm the most qualified doctor in this whole entire county emily i've got you you'll be fine you'll be like, oh right okay Amazing. what's your qualification well lobotomy from the 1920s <laughs> He, as, as he pulls open his drawer full of leeches. Um, <laughs> so don't worry, I read all the textbooks from 1913 through to 1932. I do think it's I've starting got, yeah. to bring in more because it does still cover brain development and I do think it's starting to, to oh, embed that a little bit Thank more. God for that. But I mean, I mind covering brain development, so we've been doing that for a while. That's what I mean. But um, yeah, I think the, the, the fact that people say it's an easy qualification, it's the easy route. It's it's the one that nobody wants to do, so you easily done. I just isn't think fair. a lot of the theorists and a lot of the early theorists, the principal the principality of their work and, and the principal points are still correct. <laughs> yeah. So let's say to, to a degree. But a lot of the scientific research behind their work or the existence of the scientific research isn't really there. A lot of it's based upon, ah, oh, this is sort of my idea and I got 30 kids together and it proved me right. Or in other cases, I've sort of got a group of rats together and give it a go. And it sort of worked. So this yeah. is my point. A lot of the the, the science, scientific backing nowadays to make it a theory and a point and accept it as fact, it would be thrown out because the amount of rigorous scientific... Has uh, to go through. Yeah, like, yeah. Look, I mean, look at the, the, the way they fast-tracked all the COVID jabs and stuff. Like, the amount of rigorous stuff you have to go through. And a theory is different to something that's sticking in you. I completely understand the processes yes. behind it different. I just think there's so much scientific research that's gone on the last 10, 15 you can even go back to 20 years since 2004. There's so much has happened. That should be informing practice our yeah. qualifications. That should be being forced through and pushed into our understanding now. The, 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 the staff members qualifying today shouldn't be learning the same theoretical stuff as people who qualified in the 90s. No, they shouldn't. Because but... science and our understanding has come on so much since then. Yeah. But we're not embracing that. People are being left to do it. Uh, hello, the Early Years Network. Thank God we're here. I was going to say, <laughs> because alongside your qualification, you, or any sort of uh, job, you can jump on the Early Years Network and continue to develop. <laughs> I, I, I just think, you know, it's, it's, it's a very... Le it's like um, we talked about education as a whole um, last week. Outdated. We've, we've adopted this antiquated model. No one sat down and gone, hang on a second. Come on, it, doesn't make sense that the principles and what everyone's learning is still the same yeah. decade after decade after decade 
at some point, surely we're not going to go on another 100 years still. Oh, there was this chap called Balby who 200 years ago had a bad relationship with his mum and this stemmed this idea and this theory. We've got to have more scientific evidence, surely, at that point. You'd like to hope so in 100 years' time. Uh, if, look, if it's still the same in 50 years, I'll do it. All right, I'll just do that. <laughs> Could someone, someone clip that? I will be 80 years old, but... <laughs> you could give it a go. I'll give it. If I can still remember my own name, yeah, sure. <laughs> so... <laughs> Excuse me. That's that one. It's not an easy qualification. N no, that, is that what we started with? <laughs> yeah, you kind of went off on a different <laughs> ball game, but that's fine. Okay. Um, number six. Yeah. Children won't learn anything until they go to school, so they don't need to go to an early year setting. So, all of the things that we've discussed on the previous 20 episodes of the Little Minds Big Ideas podcast will probably counteract that. And all of the videos on the Early Years Network platform also counteract it. Yep. Learning happens in the learning that happens in an early year setting is fundamental for a happy, thriving, and confident child in the future. Mm -hmm. And we know that those first five years lay the foundations. And when children have access to education that comes from an early year setting, it allows them to have the best possible start with loads and loads of learning opportunities. And I don't like anyone in the industry knows that, but that again is a society stereotype, like we talked about last week. Yeah. Learning starts at primary school, and it doesn't. We know that those first five years are crucial and the development that happens in those first five years. You've just talked about baby rooms and how important those are. And yeah, I think the very old fashioned approach that learning starts at school is is gone out. Like we're, we're moving past that. I don't know if we are, but I think we're trying to move we're, past We're it. trying to move past it. And as we've talked about loads of time as the gong again, cha-ching. We talked about funding and actually shouldn't it should it be going to the people that can't access yeah. the early years education because then they can and and that's the difference. We're not going into that today. It becomes um We're not. No, no, but it becomes <laughs> quite a uh, ethical conversation, doesn't yeah. it, when you go down like these people earn two hundred grand a year between them, but their childcare bill because they've got two is like three grand. Like it just becomes a very ethical battle, doesn't it? Yeah. But I think the bottom line is if you have the approach of those most in need and most vulnerable should get the get biggest it. slice of the pie. If that's your idea, then you're probably not far off. No, exactly. Um, and we know that children need to go to early years and have that education from early years that early years settings and environments provide. It doesn't just start when you get to reception in year one. No. Um, COVID sort of proved that. It did. I think the fallout or the long, the biggest long-term fallout from COVID and the biggest, oh, people are probably going to shout at me on the internet for this. But this okay. People on the internet are so nice. <laughs> what I'm about to say probably is uh, a little bit off, but I would say one of, one of, let's say one of, not the biggest, one of the biggest fallouts and the biggest um, losers from um, COVID and lockdown was children. Yes. Uh, obviously the poor people who lost relatives and who died themselves, obviously, you know, the care home industry took an absolute hammer in. Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was really shit for a lot of people. I'm, please don't come and shout at me saying, oh, what about the people who lost their lives? Yeah. Obviously, they lost out the most. Yeah. But... <laughs> Quickly wrap that up. <laughs> <laughs> Move forward. I think about myself a bigger role. But children... Yeah, they did. ...lost out massively. I mean, I remember at one point when we were in lockdown, messages, I mean, every, every community has like Facebook groups that end up being arguments about who shit on my lawn <laughs> and has Who's anybody seen my box <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> whose hands are these where's my Amazon parcel <laughs> but during lockdown I remember there used to be people who would look out their windows and report like groups of children playing and I don't mean youths hanging around corners for no good I mean like literally just like a Keeping group a of five year olds wanting to play football in a park with a couple of dads mm. who are these children it's absolutely disgusting that they should be like like come on and and that was the and that's the thing like children lost so much in terms of social um, communication. Not just communication though, but oh, I saw a video on TikTok last week, and it was from after the pandemic, and it was two little boys. They were in America, and oh, it's gonna make me cry. And they saw each other for the first time since like the COVID lockdown. And they were like on, they were on a path and one of them got out of the car and he was walking, he was like, I can't remember when they say his name, I don't know, Joseph. And he was going, oh, it's Joseph, it's Joseph. And he ran like as fast as his little legs could carry him. And his friend ran in the other direction and they gave each other such a big 
hug and oh my God, I was like, they are like four years old <laughs> and they've had a connection before that lockdown. Yeah. And the fact that they missed each other so much to the point where they ran down the street afterwards when they were allowed to see each other. I thought, oh my God, like those are like two years of their life yeah. where they've lost the ability to build that relationship, but it was still there. But it's not, it, and it's, it's oh, not just it that. Heart. It's also like dealing with crowds and like adults can get very anxious in crowds yeah. and those scenarios. So to miss out on in this, like what we know is being a really crucial crossroads of brain development and emotional development mm -hmm. and behavioral development that comes with that emotional and, and cognitive development to miss out on how to handle those situations and scenarios until you get to the age of potentially like if it happened when you're one, two, you don't get into those scenarios. And we all know children learn best by experiences. You can't teach a child how to handle large volumes of crowds or, or those sort of anxious them, moments. Yeah. You can't put it on TV and be like, oh, little Johnny, this is what a supermarket really busy looks like. You need to experience it. And what do you mean we don't have to queue outside the supermarket yeah. to go in with only four other people? <laughs> Mummy, they don't have masks on. <laughs> yeah, what's going on? But like, I think that I think that went and showed did lockdown the fallout of it and what we saw from a social development, what we saw from emotional development and how much of a backward step so many children took all didn't see the progression you would commonly see within children of that age. Yeah. Went and showed how crucial that period of time is and and, and that exposure to come into early years settings and you know if you can afford it do it i would always say try and make it work because yeah. gain and, it, and it's going to get easier now because two-year-old funding kicks in and soon it'll be rolled out to uh, everyone and yeah yeah but <laughs> i'm not going to go down that route we're not having that conversation today but one of you principally what it means is if it means more children get that better yeah yeah so yeah they're not pointless everyone keep doing what you're doing <laughs> No, I think, I think everyone in the industry knows it's not. I know, but sometimes it's nice to just get that little boost of, yeah, no, yeah, you're right, yeah. Do a great job. Everybody works in the early years as an in, in fundamentally... Incredible job. But a really important job, of you know, course. and a really, really important role. And it does often get... Overlooked. Yeah. But yeah, okay. Last one. Last one. Your environment doesn't need to <laughs> resemble an old people's home for it to be engaging. <laughs> I wrote this. You did write that one. And I think... In terms of looking like an old people's home, no, it doesn't. But there are elements to having open-ended resources and authentic resources that is good for children's it, development. It is. I, it, that purely came because I saw a photograph this morning on Facebook and this setting had posted pictures. And you know what? The person who did it had put so much time and effort into like fair play to them. It, I'm sure it's a fabulous setting, but when I saw a picture of it, I did have to second glance because like, I'm fairly sure. You know, when you see like, old people's like communal areas in retirement homes and they've got like the um like the white frilly stuff on the tables you know, yeah, the, the other table things, clubs, yeah. yes and um like all the furniture looked like something from the 1920s and they had like big bowls of like Weetabix and cereals out on the side but it was really high up so it looked like it was you know sometimes we go to like a, a yeah um a uh b and b yeah yeah and it's all up and there. it's got the breakfast on the next day it's all on the sides and so i just i looked at it and went what is this? Like, fair play to going all to the effort and doing what they've done and resourcing everything. But don't look at Pinterest, don't look at Instagram and Facebook and think that you have to make your setting yeah. into an old people's home. You don't need a, re a record player from the 1920s. You don't need all this. But record players are good. And if you can source one that even is a bit modernised, it's great because they're not used anymore, but they are a great resource to have. Yeah, yes and no. What I'm trying to say is people will look at it and think, oh, I don't have a record player, my nursery's oh, rubbish. Course. And they'll feel a bit shit about themselves because they Obviously can't go out and source all these things. What I'm trying to say is you could go to an exceptional, outstanding nursery and they won't have any of that in yeah. their setting because what they do fundamentally, the most important parts of it are to do with your engagement with the children your uh, interaction with them, how you're providing them opportunities to be an exposure to language. Of All course. of this yeah. stuff is the basics and the principle of it. Yeah. If everything in there is incredibly modern and they get access to all the resources and da-da-da-da. that's fine brilliant. too. <laughs> if you have a really, really low budget and going into charity shops and everything is how you can make it work, fantastic. Do it. Yeah. But don't follow along with a trend because it's a trend. Yeah. Have your own reason for it. 
going to charity shops and doing it is, 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 is caught on. One, because it's proliferated across social media. People see it. Yeah. And then there's two strands. Some people have copied it. Yeah. Because they think they should be doing that. Other people have gone, flipping heck, it's going to save me a fortune. What a great yeah. idea. But that is a correct answer, the correct way of looking at it, if you need to. I think as well, like Doing you said, it for the sake of doing it. it doesn't benefit, you're not doing it because your children, you're not doing it because you're doing it like, because you've seen it and it looks nice. all right, I guess, yeah. in your eyes. But I think as well, though, if you want to change your environment and the reasons behind it are going to benefit the children and you do think more authentic resources and less closed-end resources will help your environment to move forward, 100% do it. But you don't have to do it in the same ways that everybody, like others are doing it as well. But is, is it all record player an authentic resource? Because this so, isn't something a child will ever actually have to use. We have a record player. You don't ever actually have to use it. No, you don't. It's a very real scenario where someone who is now three years old may never actually touch a record player. Yes, I know. That's absolutely fine. But that's the same for some other resources. I'm trying to think. A dinosaur. I'm never going to see a dinosaur. A dinosaur... Children is inherently more attracted and interested in a velociraptor. Isn't that weird though? Why? No, that, Where does that come from? Because name me a three-year-old who's like, I'm really into BB King. Or like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like, no, but how weird is that? I've just thought, why dinosaurs? Because they're wicked. They're yeah, but, big. They've got massive teeth. Yeah, but they're scary they, as shit. Why, why do we use dinosaurs? Because they're cool. Yeah, but uh, we've never seen one. We don't even know if it's true. I've watched Jurassic Park. Which, I've been to the Natural History Museum. I've seen the bones. So, okay, fine. But do you know what I'm saying? Is what, what I'm saying is, no. is... Okay, what I'm saying... If I'm a three-year-old and I'm looking at a... Okay, Miss Emily has brought in a record player with Luther with Vandross. With Baby Shark on. Well, you, <laughs> yeah, right. I've got the record of Baby Shark. I think you're all good to me. <laughs> Billy Ocean's playing on it. Versus Ben, who has got... Jurassic Park on in the background and a massive dinosaur in his hand. I only watched that for the first time a couple of years ago, didn't I? Because you're weird. Emily has not seen it. If you write a list of your top 100 films... Hundreds a big number. If you write a list of your top 100 films, I bet Emily's seen less than 10. Oh. You don't see any of The Godfathers, have you? No. Scarface? No. Uh, I'm trying to think of all the classics, like every single film ever. You didn't see Jurassic Park? I have now. I've seen yeah, the first not one. then. Have you seen... You hadn't seen Schindler's List until we watched it. Oh, no, yeah, that was a lot. You though. never watched Game of Thrones. She hadn't even seen Harry Potter. Shut up, <laughs> yes, I had. <laughs> right, we've gone off a list. But yeah, don't do things just to follow a trend. Do it for your setting and for the reasons Do it for your children. kids. <laughs> do, it for... do it for the children. I thought like, it was like Robbie Williams, wasn't it? Saying, We're doing it for the kids. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Jump on board. Are you all right? Where are we taking this? Oh, it's Friday. <laughs> um, so, yeah. <laughs> you've lost me. I'm don't out. put things in your environment for the sake of putting it in your yeah. environment because you've seen other people do it. Yeah. Also, do you know what? When I put, whenever I talk about this on social media, I always get loads of messages being like, thank you so much for this because I'm feeling really down. Yeah. And it, it's not peer pressure because no one's actually peer pressuring you into it, but you, you do get those across all you strands do. of life. You see... Influencers of all sorts who are running six times a day, or go to look the gym amazing, all the time, and yeah, or get and sent clothes left, right, and center, and walking around in four hundred pound jackets. And look, don't fall for it. Be proud of what you can do, and if you're doing your best, that's all I'd that matters. Bet my isn't bomb it? dollar, you're doing a fantastic job, and your environment doesn't have to be all bells and whistles. Your environment, does, you see, people take these photographs, and I always think. This, a three-year-old hasn't touched any of that stuff for a while. Like <laughs> A three-year-old has not been anywhere near that environment. You're going to take a picture of it. Take a picture of it for me in three weeks' time when the kids have had yes. full run through it for the last three weeks. Uh, and I'm not knocking the people who put stuff on social media. No, because it is nice to see because inspiration. Because they're equally in their own way done a fantastic job. It's nice to see what other people are doing, but it doesn't mean you have to do it as well. No, and I sometimes watch it, and I do look at some of the stuff, and I just think, there's just, just no need. You've gone, you've gone way too far. Yeah. Um, it's like the tough trays. They're a golden one. Yeah. The tough trays that look, someone looks like that Picasso's gone to work on it for about an hour. Oh, yeah. If it's taking longer than five minutes, don't do it. What's the point? Like, <laughs> no, they're not going to... Children are not going to engage with it if you put... And too much going on and, and you've... Because you won't want them to touch it. And don't underestimate a child's imagination. Yes. You can take a group of children to an area that you've done absolutely nothing with and you can dial into their imagination with stories 
and oh, what if and, and all this jazz yeah. and they can go somewhere you could never even imagine they're going to go with it. They don't visually need to see it like we do. We lose our ability to use our imagination. Yeah, it's always drained out of us because it's not cool when you're in school to have a really good imagination. It's seen as being a nerd. And then as you get older, it's just, you know, it's not yeah. something you do, is it? Play disappears. Imaginations and stuff is, is so important. Children have it in abundance. They don't need to explicitly see it and recreate no. it in such a vivid way like we do. No, they don't. Um, so those were our seven... Myths. What takes and myths that we wanted to just say? Uh -uh. Maybe we'll do it next time and make it even spicier. Oh, really God. go for some spicy myths. Myths? Spicy myths? Spicy takes? Spicy takes? Um, so yeah, that was us this morning. Hope you've enjoyed. Let us know your thoughts in the comments. Yep. And on social media, let us know. But be nice. Just opinions. You okay. could have opinions too. Let's have it. Maybe, maybe that's what we need to do. Remember that? Um, oh. It was on America. It was like Jimmy Kimmel show or something like that, where they used to read out like all their hate comments. They used to get the celebrity, didn't they? We don't get that many, so we don't need to. But, but that's what I'm saying. If it's people send us hate no. comments, no, <laughs> no, don't because I will just block you. <laughs> okay. Send us. Okay, send me hate comments. No, I will still block you. <laughs> and um, we'll do it. We'll read them out and react to them. You're a nightmare today. What's going on? I've had so much coffee. Okay, right. Well, on that note, we will leave you to the rest of your Monday. Enjoy your week. Have a lovely time. And we will have a lovely time. <laughs> have a lovely time in your week. And um, we will catch you in the next one. Bye, guys. Bye.